Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, I am going to give everyone just uh, a couple more minutes as folks are um, joining us on this call. But in the meantime, um, we'll just welcome the folks who are already here. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight, everyone. I'm Jen Bradovich. I'm our Director of Exhibitions and Programs here at Queen Center, New York. And on the Zoom with me tonight is Robin Siddle, our Exhibitions and Programs Coordinator. Robin works really hard on this program and takes care of all aspects of it. So Thanks, Robin, for being here and for all the work you do on New Voices. Excited to be here. Excited to talk about New Voices, my favorite program. Your favorite program and uh, going into year three of your favorite program. So I am excited to chat a little bit about with uh, a little bit about it with you tonight. Um, so we are hosting this info session tonight for New Voices. This is our annual open call program. Um, if you're familiar with us at Print Center, you know that we rolled out New Voices in 2022. And we spent uh, the last two years really working on the program as it's gone through its first two um, iterations with two uh, cycles of an artist cohort. The exhibition for the second year of the program uh, is currently on view in the Jordan Schnitzer Gallery at Prince Center, New York, and it's up until August 24th. So you have just a couple weeks left to see it if you're local. Um, and you can also learn, learn, learn more about the artists and their practices on our website, princetonnewyork.org. Um, and you can also get a link to the publication for the show, which has an essay by um, independent curator Olivia Shao, who led the cohort selection process for this current cycle and who organized um, this show, the theme of which is ritual. Um, so we've just opened the application for the 2025 cycle. That's open until September 6, right, Robin? Great. And we are here tonight to give an overview of the program and um, kind of go over like what makes a strong application for the program. And then we'll also take your questions. So we're gonna try to be really thorough, but we wanna hear your questions as well. Um, the session also has auto-generated captions. Hit the CC button at the bottom of your screen to turn those on. And it's also being recorded. So if you have to, to, to leave at any point, um, you can check back online in like about a week, Robin, is that right? and um, you can see what you missed. Um, Robin, how would you like folks to submit questions? Um, the Q&A is open, so if you wanna make sure we see something, just pop it in there. Um, if it's something pertinent as we're talking, we'll be happy to sort of answer those as we go. Otherwise, we'll have time for a longer Q&A towards the end of the, the webinar today. Um, and if you just have any comments about stuff or just wanna say hello, you can do that in the chat. Awesome. I see a lot of people popping in and saying where they're coming in from and joining us. Thanks all of you for saying hello. Um, and in case there are folks who aren't familiar with Print Center, um, double welcome to you. We're super excited to have you here. We are a nonprofit in New York City. We're formerly known as International Print Center New York or IPCNY. Um, and we explore the medium of print within broader artistic and cultural contexts. Um, we are an exhibition space. We aim to support innovative scholarship and curatorial work in print to support emerging artists working in our field and provide rich programming for the public. Um, in 2002, we, or 2022, we moved into our new home at 535 West 24th Street on the ground floor, right in the middle of Chelsea. So this really increased our accessibility and our visibility and capacity for programming. And so New Voices has been a really exciting part of this next chapter of our organization. And each year that we do it, we learn how to make it a stronger program. So our gratitude to the artists who apply each year and who participate in the cohort program and to our guest uh, curators and all of those from the art world that kind of come through the program with us. Um, they're all helping to make this a stronger program. So um, I think we've got enough folks here now. We can kind of get started. This is just a, a kind of roadmap for what we're going to be doing today. Um, Robin and I will just kind of be switching off as we go. Um, and we'll kind of return to this slide with um, Kind of like a highlighted section throughout uh, that will show you kind of where we are orient you to where we are in the presentation um anything i'm forgetting robin we can get started get started awesome so um what is new voices this is our first um our first step so essentially new voices is um a two-part program there's an open call process that leads to um, the creation of an artist cohort and the artist cohort um, receives an exhibition, and then they receive artist development programming. So you can kind of think of that as the two sides of what this program aims to achieve. 
The cohort is selected by a, an invited curator who is different every year. We select six to eight artists. They get this exhibition and then they develop their practices through kinds of um, kind of touch points with each other and with folks in the art world, as, as we like to try to think about it. Um, and we tailor those to the interests and the needs of the cohort. So it's the support is very individualized. Um, so as I mentioned, there's a group exhibition um, that is June through August of next summer. There's a three-day in-person intensive the first weekend in June. Um, there is artist-driven public programming, and then there's also um, virtual support uh, that's like more uh, supporting your professional practice, supporting your artistic practice throughout the summer and fall. Uh, and then, of course, there's financial support. All right, and then what is New Voices uh, not? And what does it not offer? Because sometimes there's some confusion in the application process about kind of the limits of support that the program offers. Be sure that you know that New Voices is not a residency program, and it is also not a call for proposals for like making new work. Um, so we do not offer access to studio facilities. We do not commission or provide financial support for the creations of new bodies of work or like research for new bodies of work, things like this. Um, we do not provide living or workspace for the duration of the program. And we do not provide any uh, training or certification in any technical skills. So now that we've heard all the exciting things that this program isn't, we're gonna go back and get amped up about what the program is, which is a great exhibition artist development uh, opportunity. And the eligibility is um, pretty, simple, but let's go through it step by step. First of all, um, to be eligible, applicants have to be based in a U.S. state or territory. Um, please be aware that U.S. citizenship is totally not a requirement, but sort of the limitations of our support um, for things like travel, shipping, and all that kind of stuff means that we need to limit our scope to the United States. Um, and then we also are going to, for those who are accepted into the cohort, need to be able to have you fill out a W-9 request for taxpayer information. Um, that can be filled out in a number of ways. If you are wondering whether or not you have one of these numbers to fill out, I recommend that you go consult with the IRS because I'm not a tax expert. Um, but that is really just about the scope of what we're able to provide geographically, not about uh, citizenship or any nationality or anything like that. Um, we encourage applications from a pretty broad pool of applicants. Um, the next eligibility is, um, as we are Prince in New York, we do ask that you engage printmaking in your practice in some way. This could be through concept, materials, techniques. Um, you do not need to identify as a printmaker to apply, um, but your work should in some way engage with printmaking or with print culture. This could be with ideas of, you know, multiples, dissemination of information, um, things like that. It could be the literal techniques that you are using coming from the printmaking field. Mostly the uh, what we are getting at is that we have connections to help support artists who have an investment in the printmaking field. So if you are primarily or exclusively working in a different medium, painting, sculpture, photography, you might not be best served by this. And we just wanna make sure that we have a good match so that we can offer you the best support possible. Um, then the third uh, eligibility criteria is that we are looking to support applicants who are currently working without institutional support, um, such as gallery representation, if it's really strong support that you're getting from a gallery, or full-time enrollment in a degree-seeking academic program related to your practice. This is a very, there's a lot wrapped up in this one little piece of eligibility, so I'm going to go through a couple different scenarios of ways that you would still be eligible or things that would make you ineligible under this point. So on that gallery front, you are still eligible. If you work with a small gallery, um, you will just be asked to share any affiliation with galleries that you have, and we will take a look at that on a case by case. Probably if you are here on your own coming to learn about this program that you're going to apply to, you are eligible. If someone's filling out applications on your behalf, maybe we're, we're a little past the window. <laughs> Um, but I wouldn't worry too much about that one. Just put that information in and we'll review it. Um, if you do not hold any degrees at all, that is totally fine. We have no requirements for any formal training, certification, academic history. 
Um, but because some of the supports that we offer are similar to things that you might find in a academic program, we just want to make sure that we are reaching out to people who have not had that kind of support recently. Um, finally, if you are a full-time student, but in a program that is not directly related to your practice, so maybe you're a printmaker, but you're in a, you know, you're getting your business degree or you're doing museum studies at the same time, those things are not really directly supporting the studio practice that you might have, and so that does not make you ineligible. On the other hand, you are not eligible if you were enrolled as a full-time student anytime in the past year, so in the 2023 to 2024 academic year, in one of these programs that is supporting your artistic practice. Um, if you are going into one of these programs starting this fall for the 2024 to 2025 academic year, we also ask that you wait until you're out of that program, out of that support to apply for this program. Um, or if you are less than a year out from one of these degree seeking programs at the time of the open call. So if you graduated from your program after July 31st of last year, then we are also going to ask that you wait until the next cycle um, so that we can um, see a little more of what kind of work you're doing outside of your MFA program. That is it for eligibility. Um, if you have particular questions about some special circumstance of your own, you're welcome to either look at our FAQ or reach out to me directly, and I can help go through that um, individual case with you. Um, but with that, Jen is going to talk a little bit about this year's call in particular. Perfect. Thanks, Robin. So the first year of our program, our theme was transformation. Um, this current cycle that we're in the middle of now, our theme is ritual. And um, our 2024 theme, or it, we could call it a theme, but I like to also think about it as like kind of a guiding uh, guiding prompt or a, um, this kind of um, intentionally open-ended place that we begin in thinking about what's going to tie everything together in the next year of the program um, is futurity. Um, and I'm going to give you some, uh, a little bit more about what, uh, what we're thinking about when we talk about futurity, um, in just a minute here. Um, first I'll tell you that the selection process is going to be led by Alana Hernandez, who's senior curator at the ASU Art Museum in Phoenix. Um, and Alana it has been working in, um, kind of a print adjacent space, but is, uh, is more so, or even more so than that, very interested in um, supporting artists who are in this kind of emerging space um, and who are thinking about uh, how, what kind of um, support and investment they need during this really critical um, time in their careers. She is the former executive director of Kala Alliance, also in Phoenix, where she developed um, an exhibition program, a residency support for artists, um, and she's held various curatorial positions at museums, including um, at the uh, Museum of Contemporary Art in San Diego. I think I got that right. And then also at the Whitney in New York. So she's tremendous. Um, we're really excited to be working with her and especially working with our first curator who's not based in New York. Um, as Alana is in Phoenix, we hope that this also helps to reach out and kind of garner some new applications from our friends out in the Southwest. Um, so Alana has selected this um, kind of guiding theme uh, for 2025, thinking about this concept of futurity. And so here's what Alana has kind of uh, written to kind of get our wheels turning. So she says, as future makers, how do we dream? What worlds or potential futures do we wish to see? What can dreaming of fantastical worlds to come do for us? Pursuing potentiality is a journey we must embark on collectively. From networks of care to communal resistance, how can we radically dream and consider wholly new social and political realities? So that's very vague, right? It's very open. And I think one strategy, Robin, that we've used so far um, in kind of working with our guest curators on these themes is that we intentionally set this to be very broad at the outset. And then as our curators kind of move through the process, the way that these ideas show up is kind of sharpened by their selections. So we we like this to be broad because we, we just want as many people applying as we can get. 
Um, and so it will be your task, and Robin will go into more detail in trying to kind of think about your work in these terms and kind of make the argument that that this had that your work has a um, some kind of a relationship to these themes. Exactly how that shows up is going to be different for every artist that um, applies, but we just encourage people to think expansively about these themes. Um, all right, so uh, up next is. Um, what does the program offer? So we're gonna go through now, I'm gonna go through some program features and expectations. So first is the compensation and the financial support. So for their time and their effort in participating in the program, which includes um, being involved in the exhibition, helping to generate the artist-led programming um, and participating in the activities of the artist cohort, each artist receives the following support. There's an unrestricted honorarium. This is an artist fee of $2,500. It's paid in installments throughout the, it's like broken up in bits um, along the way, and you can do whatever you want with it. Um, we also cover the cost of round trip shipping and framing expenses for artworks that we decide to show on the exhibition. And we work with the curator, we work with our um, team here to make reasonable choices about what those expenses look like and, and what decisions we make there. Artists are not expected to contribute to any of those costs. And then for the three day in-person um, convening, artists receive um, a meals and incidentals stipend, like a daily, um, like a per diem basically, to cover your meals and incidentals and uh, travel. Um, for those of us who are outside of New York, we cover the round trip travel and then lodging near Print Center. Um, for folks who uh, live in New York City um, and who are just going to be like commuting locally, who would just be commuting locally for the three days, um, we last year, this last year offered the option for them to also stay uh, at the hotel near the center where the rest of the cohort was staying. And so that just made life a little bit easier for them for three days. And I think they appreciated that. We'll probably do that again. In terms of the um, exhibition, uh, at, like what happens in the exhibition, you can expect the following. So you'll do a virtual studio visit with the curator. Um, that is going to mean that you are, um, uh, you know, zooming with Alana, talking more fully about your practice, just giving her like a better sense of what you make. Probably about four to six works are going to be selected for exhibition. They may or may not be works from the application. Um, often they are, but sometimes um, the artist or the co the curator, while they're having their studio visit with the artist, they need to kind of discover this other thing that's really interesting, or um, they feel really compelled by, you know, something the artist didn't apply with necessarily, and that might make it into the show. So we try to just be really open. There's also a small publication that goes with the exhibition with full color illustrations and a critical essay by the curator. There's professional photography of the installed exhibition. Hi, Robin, glad you made it back in. <laughs> uh, and then there is um, support from us on all the logistical work. So this is the shipping, the framing, the installation, the deinstallation logistics, like we handle that for you. So um, sometimes with, um, uh, you know, shows if you're like early in your career or um, you're kind of just getting to the point where you're being in a lot of shows, it, this can vary depending on the venues. The artists are expected to do a lot. We handle all of this for you. You can really just kind of handle it, hand it over to us. And then finally, direct contact with buyers. Um, we don't sell work. Um, we're a nonprofit. Uh, but if you have work that's um, available and you would like to make it available to, to potential um, folks who might want to buy it, um, we don't take any percentage of that sale, but we will connect to interested parties and let leave that to you. So there's always the opportunity that you might make a sale um, there. My favorite part about New Voice is that I get to work directly with this wonderful group of artists. And a big part of that is planning lots of activities that are really geared towards each individual within the cohort, as well as each cohort year to year is going to have different needs and interests based on their you know, varying goals, varying places that they are in their careers. Um, so the first big piece of this is this three-day cohort intensive. Previously, Jen and I had been referring to this as a gathering, but after this year's cohort went through this three days of pretty much morning to night planned out things to do centered around the opening of the exhibition, they said, you should really call this an intensive so people don't get any ideas about being on vacation while they're here. <laughs> 
Um, so pretty much we will um, bring you out to the city if you are not already living in New York. Um, we have everyone stay in a hotel near the gallery so that you're all able to um, be together for those couple of days and really get to know each other as a cohort. And then across those three days, we also plan all kinds of different activities, including in-gallery studio visits. So we'll invite different critics, curators, other artists to come to the gallery, see the exhibition, talk to you about your work right in front of it. Um, we can also plan things like behind the scenes trips to galleries, print workshops like Robert Blackburn Printmaking Workshop, Lower East Side Print Shop. We have our friends, the Gemini Gallery right upstairs who will sometimes take things out of their flat files for us, which is really exciting. Um, we also can um, build out things like conversation with other, maybe further in their career, New York-based artists, go do a studio visit with someone who is maybe where you are hoping to be in a number of years and just hear about that experience for them. We can also do things like make, in, uh, make individual appointments at different New York City institutions. Maybe you want to go visit a print study room. Someone else in the cohort has no interest in that. That's fine. We'll split you up. You can go do the thing that you're interested in. We'll make plans for that other person to go something that serves them better. Um, we also, in those three days, have time for shared meals. Um, the opening, we can get you some professional portraits with your work if that's something that you need. All of this is trying to keep... Um, no cost to you, support what you need, follow what you are asking for so that you're not sitting there all day thinking, why am I here right now? It's going to be three days of fun, fun, work, fun. <laughs> um, next one, Jen, if you don't mind. Um, the other thing that I am really excited to work on with this group of artists is the public programming. So we ask each artist to contribute to planning and executing one public program that could be virtual or in person. No need to um, you know, travel to New York just to do a program. These happen after the opening, after that three-day intensive. We let you recover from that. Um, and then throughout the rest of the summer, um, we work with you to plan the public programs that accompany the exhibition. Um, so these can be done in collaboration with another artist in the cohort. If you find someone who you're really resonating with, with the other invited guests who are sort of in your network or like wish to be in your network, um, or if it's something that you just want to do by yourself, that's okay too. Um, this could include things like an artist talk with your fellow cohort members. It could be a hands-on workshop, either a small group thing where you're just sort of intensely doing some particular process in the gallery, or it can be a sort of drop-in all day kind of deal. We had one of each of these this past weekend with this year's artists, um, Alnaz and Kate. Um, you could do something like a performance or an activation of your work in the exhibition, a conversation with invited guests on some topic of your choosing related to your work. You could lead a tour of the exhibition. Really, it is up to you to decide what is the best way to engage with the public and expand on the themes in your work, the themes in the show. And we will support all of the logistics, promotion, communication for that, and you know, compensate anyone that you want to invite in so that we can really make your dream program come true. Don't want to overpromise in the dreams department, but Jen and I do work hard to really just support whatever you see as the thing that is important for how you want to engage with the public about your work. Um, in addition to that, there is also um, a few different ways that we um, continue to be in touch with you over the course of the summer. So it doesn't just end after that three day in person meeting. Um, again, these the you'll notice that things get sort of a little more uh, general in our description as we get further out in the summer, because it really is going to vary from year to year what people find most useful. Um, it could be something like a skill building session, informal um, group critiques, sort of a work in progress now that you have this group of people to um, talk with from the cohort. Um, some sort of group workshop centered on the theme of the exhibition, presentations with thinkers or other professionals in the field. And these are all things that we plan virtually, so there's no travel or financial burden on you to participate in those things. It's just, again, meeting your needs where you're at and helping um, come up with uh, helping leverage our network and connections to um, provide opportunities for the artists in the cohort. Okay, how do I apply? Robin, I actually can't see uh, the from now where I am. I can't see who's on the slides. Is this one me or you? How, if you just give a little uh, rundown of the application. Sure. 
you'll I do the will. details. Awesome. Myself. So Robin is the person who really looks after the um, the process of the application. So she's going to give you the details, but I'll give you the intro. So you apply online via submittable. There is no fee to apply. Totally free online application. And here's what it consists of. So you're going to submit responses to three prompts that are there to contextualize your practice. You answer them in writing, 250 words each. Or you can record a, you know, like a verbal, you can record like a video or an audio of you answering them two to four minutes each, if that's your preferred method for communicating about your work. We also need your CV or resume that should have your relevant work history, exhibition history, any um, awards, uh, publications, grants, residencies, education history, et cetera. We just want to get a sense of where you are in your career. And then up to 10 images of your existing work. And that work needs to be created in the past four years. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, it kind of gestured toward this. Um, that work may or may not end up being work that's in the show. If you're selected to be in the cohort, there's a good chance that mostly it is. But sometimes in the course of um, researching your work and having conversations and doing those kind of virtual studio visits, the curator may find something that you didn't apply with that they find compelling. And so this is really a 10 images that give you give us like a, a solid and cohesive um, introduction to your practice. So okay, I'm so of... the, the questions. Yeah, so I am going to just sort of go through each of these questions that we put in this application and break them down a little bit more. Um, and then we'll also talk a little bit more about those um, work samples and some tips for picking an effective selection of work. Um, so the first question that we ask in these short answers, how is printmaking incorporated in your work? Why is print both as a process and a concept a part of your artistic practice? So, you know, we are really invested in printmaking as an art form that drives invention, collaboration, access, that it's really, you know, happening now, vital to the art community, to the greater, you know, we all love that print is out in the world. Um, so... With that in mind, we want to hear more about how and why printmaking is a part of your practice. The how might be obvious on looking at your work samples, or it might be a little more obtuse if you are doing something super, in a, uh, you know, something really unique to your own practice. Um, you can assume that application readers have a basic understanding of the major print processes. You don't need to explain what a relief versus an intaglio print is. You don't need to explain dry point versus spit bite, unless there's something about that particular process that you want to explain why you're engaging it. But you don't need to tell us what a print is. Um, we also advise in your answer that you maybe avoid generalizations like, I've always loved etching. Ever since I was young, I wanted to be a screen printer. Um, we advise that you be specific. So tell us what printmaking adds to your work that maybe could not be accomplished through another medium. So why print specifically in your practice? Um, you also might want to consider multiple contexts. So beyond the specific techniques and processes that you're using, how are you thinking about your work in the context of the greater printmaking field? If you're working in a multi or interdisciplinary fashion, how does printmaking relate to those other techniques and concepts that are driving your work? Um, and if you are really just like, I'm a printmaker, I do prints, that's what I do. That's super exciting too. And we want to hear about why that is so important to you and what you've sort of learned over the, the time that you have been working with print. What is it that keeps you in the print field coming back to it? Um, and of course, these are really just guidelines, not rules about any way that you tell your own story. You know your story of your practice and your life the best. And I think that the most compelling applications that we see come from people who really just want to tell us they know what they are, they know what they're doing, and just want to come and tell us that story really um, wholly, cohesively, authentically. Um, the next question, we want to dig into one work in particular from your application. So select one that you're going to be uploading an image of and walk us through like start to finish how it was made with attention to materials, process, research, conceptual drive. So you don't need to tell us, first I put the hard ground on, then I etched into it with this particular thing, then I put it in the acid bath for this many minutes. Less technical here and more, how are you thinking about this project as a whole? So I'm just gonna go through a couple of questions here that might inform how you're answering um, this prompt. So maybe what was the impetus for creating this work? Are you responding to a particular question, event, circumstance in the world or in your world? 
do the materials that you're using in your work have a particular origin or significance? Maybe you're using a paper made from a particular substrate or um, something about the way that you are breaking down and reusing materials that come from a specific place. Um, do you have an imagined audience? Who is that audience? What role does planning versus experimenting play in your practice? How do those two things go back and forth? Or do you do one more than the other? Um, if you could go to the next slide, Jen, I've got a few more questions. This is a new question from last year's cycle, and it was a really good question to add to the application. And um, it really takes us inside the work. And and Robin, your, your kind of questions here, you might consider really add a lot of depth to, to what folks might put in there. So thank you for adding that. That's great. Oh, and I've got more. <laughs> oh, I believe it. Um, so here, you might also think about telling us what role research plays in your practice. If it does, are you working with archives in a particular place or personal histories, a particular community story? How are you connecting with and gathering that story? Um, are you influenced by any particular artists or movements or writers? Um, what is like the, we're building out not just what's happening in this piece, but what's the greater context of around how it came into being? Um, maybe you want to tell us how the project changed from the initial concept to the final work. I know it's not going to be the same thing from start to finish as a practicing artist myself. Um, and then the hardest question of all. So if you don't want to answer this one in your prompt, you can skirt right past it. How did you decide that the work was complete, finished, ready to put in this application? Um, so lots of things to choose from on how you want to get into this, but really something that's going to illuminate how you're working and what your what your thought process throughout the creation of some work or body of work is like. And then finally, um, we want to hear about how your practice engages with the curator's guiding theme this year in particular. So. Um, uh, for this iteration, as we said, we're talking about futurity, potentiality, world building, fantasy, as Jen mentioned before, very expansive, very broad way of defining it. And that is intentional so that you can really think about um, the prompt as it's laid out and then really think about how you are engaging with that. What makes this call's theme speak to you and to your practice in a way that maybe the last two cycles have not? Ritual, maybe that's not your jam, but futurity, totally what you're into. And that's why we like having a new theme and a new curator every year um, to just bring in new ideas, new ways of thinking about print. Alrighty, then work samples. Here I'm just showing you a little screen grab of what the um, upload feature and submittable looks like. So for each work that you upload, it will pop up these fields for you to fill in some information about it, title, year, medium, dimensions. Dimensions are super helpful. Don't skip that part because it really helps us understand the scale of what we're working with instead of just the little thumbnails that we get to see on our screen. Um, and then if it's if you're into traditional editioning, you can give us that information. If you're a one-off kind of person, totally fine. <laughs> um, we ask, as Jen mentioned before, that you give us up to 10 images of existing work created within the last four years. Um, so I guess we're sort of closing the window on any of that pre-pandemic uh, work. That date is slowly <laughs> creeping up, hard to believe. Um, and you can also include works in progress if you anticipate that they will be finished by the end of this year. Hard to, to judge, but if you're in the middle of something that really you think resonates with the theme, really shows something about your practice, there will be time for you to talk with the curator about it more further down the road if it's something that resonates. And we won't want you to miss out on sharing that just because it's not in its finished state right this second in August. Um, and then one little technical detail. Image files, doesn't really matter what the dimensions are as long as the overall file is under five ooh, MB megabytes, I think. Don't make it too big so that um, we're able to load those images, please. But we do want to be able to see them. Um, and if you have, if you work with video in some way and you want to include that in your work samples, consider just editing that down to a couple of minutes if it's a long form kind of video. Um, we appreciate that. If it's of interest, we will look into it more, but a one to three minute preview would be a great place to start. Um, and then the one other thing that I was going to say, oh gosh, I had some particular thing about image files, but that's okay. Ever, all the information is in the application itself. Go right ahead, Jeff. All right. 
tips for work samples. Is this, you want me to do this one? Okay, great. So our biggest tip for work samples is again, just think about your application as your introduction of your practice to the curator, right? So Robin, how long would you say someone has when looking at these applications? We get 500 of these a year. You're looking through images pretty quick, right? So you kind of want to craft this um, selection of images in a way that tells a really compelling story about your practice. And if you do a lot of different type of work, that can be, you know, kind of challenging. But I would say just like... Um, that's where some of your writings, your um, questions can maybe come into play, right? Where you can kind of help us understand the breadth of what you do. Some people just have like very expansive practices, but really just think about like, these are not 10 disjointed things I've done. It's like, this is my portfolio of work that I want this curator to, to know me by. And we'll go from there if we're interested. Um, now some actual, just like nitty gritty tips, make sure that you're sharing clear, high quality images professional photos, we know they're expensive and you don't need to, you don't need to use those. Um, we get it. Part of why we provide those things as part of the program is that we, is that we know it's expensive. Um, just make sure that your pictures are well lit and in focus. Um, especially iPhone cameras can do anything. iPhone cameras are great. It, you don't have to like do more than that. Just like Make sure that we can see the entire image. Sometimes if it's like cut off, we're like, what is this? It's just like, remember, we're, we're looking at all this digitally and we don't have that much context. So just make sure we can see it as clearly as possible. Um, again, showing a body of work. Try to make sure that this is giving us a really cohesive view into your practice. It should show how you think and, and work as an artist, right? And then also balancing breadth and depth. Again, just embrace that variety and experimentation. Show us that you aren't just making the same print over and over and over again, right? Um, but like uh, make sure that you're still threading that needle and, and finding a kind of coherent story that you can tell through your entire application. Um, general tips. So overall, we think about a strong application kind of demonstrating the following. Um, a clear artistic point of view. Um, it, it, when we take it together, we look at everything, the work should feel cohesive. It should feel that it's motivated by some kind of inquiry, something that is driving you to do this work. Gus, kind of look at it, look at it again, think about something, kind of want to look at it again, you know, uh, kind of feels feels like it has an artistic um, uh, yeah, point of view or kind of presence. It should also be connected to the theme. Um, again, the theme is very um, open-ended on purpose. Um, sometimes we get people who apply every year and like you could kind of just tell like maybe you're just applying uh, every year and you're using the same work samples and the same writing every time. It's not really connecting to the theme this is like not a great application, right? Your strongest application is going to be one that really makes a compelling story for why your, your practice is thinking about these ideas that our curator is interested in. And then finally, um, this one's really important as Robin mentioned, that print plays a central role in the practice. We have to understand as Print Center New York why you're working with print and why you wanna do this program that we can uniquely um, leverage what we can give you in, in the print world. So if you're a painter and you are making inkjet prints of your paintings, this is probably not gonna be a strong application. Robin, is this you? When will I hear back? This Great. is me. When and, will I hear and, back? And just as we get toward the end here, this is a good point just to remind people to start putting some questions in the Q&A there because this last bit will be pretty quick and then we can take we can take questions. Yeah. Um, so we're going to go through a little timeline here. Jen, since I'm no longer in control of these slides, you're going to have to do some clicking to follow my my illustrated uh, timeline. So we're just gonna go through the general timeline of sort of what's happening on our side throughout the next couple of months, and then some key dates that you can expect to hear from us around particular dates. So if we can keep it moving. Um, so August, September, right now, online application is available through Submittable. Again, no fee to apply. Um, share it far and wide. You're not committing your friends to any kind of uh, payments if they are interested in applying. Um, then on September 6th, um, applications will close at 11.59. Um, I think Eastern is what it's set to right now, but I, I can change that so that it's um, 
11 59 p.m west coast um but if you uh want to just get it in and get to bed by 9 p.m west coast time that's totally fine too um if you run into any issues while you're doing this technical issues maybe something's happening with your computer something's happening in your life and you just need an extra day that weekend um to finish your application out and get it in that's totally okay just shoot me a message and let me know and i'll keep that open for you life happens. I, this does not need to be the thing that the straw that breaks the camel's back. If you're having a rough weekend, that particular day, um, then, um, the first thing that happens is that I go through all these applications and I just screen through for any, you know, stray painters who made their way in there, who may not just have, be the right fit for this program. Um, if you, for some reason are ineligible, or I have any questions for you about your eligibility, I'll reach out by September 30th. Um, if you are eligible and you're just moving along to the review um, by the curator, then you won't hear anything from me. So if no news is good news for this part. Then um, September and October, um, Alana will review the eligible applications and is working to go from that big pool of maybe 500 applicants down to a group of 40 finalists who we want to really dig into those practices more as Alana is figuring out um, sort of what the focus and how what the interpretation of this theme is going to be for this year. So then um, November and December, um, we are going to continue to review those materials. Jen, if you could click again, I think I got myself out of order here. Yeah. So by November 15th, we will select the finalists for the program. So by November 15th, you can expect to hear either accepted or declined as a finalist. Then after November 15th, we will continue to review those materials. We might reach out to you with some extra questions um, as we are digging into your materials a little bit more for that group of finalists. Next bit. Um, then moving across the holidays into the new year in January and February, um, we will work with Alana to narrow down from that group of 40 finalists to that smaller group of six to eight artists to invite to the cohort. And all in all, you can expect to hear back by February 15th um, about whether you will, are being invited forward to the cohort or if, unfortunately, with just such a small group in the end, there are only so many people that we can accept. Um, so big dates for you to remember, November 15th to learn if you are moving on to the finalist round and February 15th um, is when you can expect to hear about the cohort selection. Um, so then I'm just gonna go through a couple other um, places that you can get support um, in the coming weeks while the call is still open. Um, one is our website, so princelearnnewyork.org, new voices, app support, or you can follow the menus on the website to find that. Um, on that page, you can find um, first of all, the list of different materials and resources along with the FAQ. So there are lots of um, questions that you might have about your eligibility or about um, the work that you're applying with, about the program itself. FAQ has a lot of information, so I definitely recommend looking there. Um, if you have particular questions about your own application, something you're just not seeing an answer for that you would prefer to just maybe talk about face to face, sometimes that's easier. I'm going to be hosting two sets of drop in office hours. So the idea here is just that there will be a zoom link available on our website. And if you have a question, I will just take people into that zoom meeting one at a time, we can talk for a couple minutes and um, help figure out whatever is going on. If it's a technical question, I'll do my best. If it's about the program at large, we can talk through that. Um, so that is going to be Wednesday, August 21st, 4 to 6 p.m. So that is just next week already. And then Thursday, August 29th from 2 to 4 p.m. And there's no RSVP or registration needed for that. Just on those days and those times, follow that link on our website to come and chat with me. Um, in addition to that, um, if there's anything that's not answered in these ways or you're not available to come to those office hours, just shoot me an email, programs at princecenternewyork.org, and put in the subject line, new voices, additional supports that I know what you're asking about. <laughs> All right. Okay, I think we've reached the exciting part. Um, we have a couple questions coming in here. Um, I will... Um, take, uh, I'll just kind of grab them. Um, our, okay, Rachel asks, if as part of 10 images, I might include a project that involves both printmaking and creative writing components, should I plan to devote at least one image to a writing sample? That's a good question. 
unusual question. Not, I mean, not one that we, I think have gotten or uh, Robin, you, you get a lot of questions from applicants. <laughs> you had a question like this before? Um, not in particular, but I like it because I'm a letterpress printer. So the crossover of text and art, I totally get. Um, I think that if they are part of sort of the same, I, I can't speak just from this question of how those things are connected, but if you have something that has maybe visual and writing that would be presented together, I would put those both in the application or, um, you could also, um, let's see. Yeah, I think it's okay to include that in your in your images and just let us know in um, that might be something that you want to dig into more in that question about expanding on one of your works to sort of tell us about how those things are working together. Um, and if we feel like we're missing some piece of information, we'll reach out and ask you for more. So don't yeah. feel like you're missing the opportunity to share. Yeah, cool. I think um, I think that's a good opportunity to really note that like when we do that finalist, once we've got those finalists round, like Robin is kind of working with Alana to to go back and forth with kind of additional requests for information that Alana might have from from artists um, that that she needs more information about. So Rachel, this might be a situation where you know Alana would like to see some of the writing just to kind of get a better understanding of the practice, and so that's a good way to get that into if you were to make it to a finalist round. Yeah, and I I think that um I would I would say if it's something that's really a core component like of that art and writing working together, I would include it in those examples up top so that we know from the start sort of like these are two practices that are working in tandem. Yeah. Yeah, great. Um anonymous asks, are projects made in collaboration with someone else okay to submit? I think it depends on what the collaboration looks like. Um Right now, we are not really able to accept like groups of artists. So like, um, you know, an artist um, collaborative of some kind or what's oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, collective, collective is the word I'm looking for. So if you are part of some kind of sort of collective or like established partnership that is like often making work together, um, we don't necessarily have the capacity to support sort of like a group of artists as one unit at this time. Um, if it's something that was, if it's sort of like one off, a one off project as part of your broader practice that was done with someone else or like community based work as part of your practice, then I think that that's totally okay. What do you think, Jen? I think we have to, I think it's a little bit of a, of a case by case in the sense that it's like, if you and a, you and a colleague produce like bodies of work together collectively as a kind of artistic, um, collaborative team, um, then I think we can't support that. The program is not currently set up to be able to support that. I think if you have some work that could potentially be in your application and could potentially be on a view where someone else contributed to a component of the work, but it's still like your work. Um, I could see that being fine, but it, to understand the precise nature of the collaboration would be um, kind of more uh, more needed, I think. And um, that's a great question to email Robin um, with some more particulars if you have like um, a situation that you need a little more information on. Great. Um, another anonymous says, um, can one identify as a printmaker? This is a philosophical question. Can one identify as a printmaker and still be considered innovative enough to be considered? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Do you want to say any more about that? Um, I Especially think, as a as a printmaker yourself. Sure. I think that I'm I'm guessing this is coming in response to a couple of different things we're talking about being yeah. multi interdisciplinary. I don't think that that just needs to be, um, you know. I think that everything that we do is interdisciplinary. It doesn't have to be that you're, you know, fusing printmaking with some other creative practice um, that you're like really pushing the technique in that way. But I do think um, you are probably engaging right with some other like social political kinds of things. So like it's all interdisciplinary in that way is going to be my liberal arts answer to that question. <laughs> um, but no, certainly if you are a printmaker through and through and that is like what you are committed to, that's great. And that we would love to hear about how that is, um, how that became what your practice is um, in that question about how and why printmaking. Maybe you just want to tell us why printmaking itself is so special to you. And that is like the thing that you do. 
Yeah, um, I totally agree, Robin. Um, I think there can be in the application material. In fact, one when we were um, doing a lot of uh, focus groups around this project before it um, launched, we got some feedback from one of the focus groups that perhaps it um, seemed too interdisciplinarily biased, right? That it seemed to... Um, uh, in in trying to stick our claim so thoroughly for thinking about how print participates with other mediums and other ways of working that we had maybe overstated it. And so I, but I agree with you, Robin, that um, through and through printmakers absolutely are welcome to apply. Um, I think the question of innovation, we could talk about all night, um, but I think what's important is um, I think the, that for this person asking this question, one way of, of kind of teasing this out might just be like thinking about um, the place of technique. And I would maybe suggest that if, um, if technique is driving the practice, then it may not, um, it may not find a place, but if the um, work that you're doing um, puts that technique and your technical skill in the service of like a broader inquiry than a hundred percent. Does that sound right to you, Robin? Uh, I think so. And I think just generally we are trying to be expansive rather than restrictive, right? Absolutely. And that includes just like what your printmaking practice might be if you were like, I've been, you know, a woodblock printer for 30 years and like, here's the evolution of that. And particularly here's where it's gone in the last couple of years. Like, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. We certainly have people who were making some like very traditional, using some very traditional print practices in um, the the first, especially the first um, cohort um, yeah. of new voices. Yeah. Great question. Right. Thank you. A couple more coming in. Uh, Catherine one says, in the... oh, what? There's oh. one in the chat. Did you see that? Oh, chat? okay. I didn't see that one. Let I just me want to do... grab that one real quick. Oh, okay. Grab, grab that one. one. I didn't right. see the chat yet. Okay, what's that one say? Um, so Cameron asks, um, does it work against us if we have applied before and you've seen some of our prints already? Absolutely, it does not work against you because maybe I have seen them before, but Alana, the curator for this year, has never seen your work before. Unless she has, certainly. If she knows your work, <laughs> then that's great. But she has not seen your application to New Voices from previous years, so there is nothing wrong with reusing parts of an earlier application and just make sure that you are thinking about how it relates to this year's theme in particular, how you can sort of update that, how your thinking has evolved in the past year to some of those questions since the last application. Um, but there's nothing wrong with using um, images that you've used in the past if they're still, you know, good evergreen examples of what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and especially if you've made it to the finalist round in the past, like keep, keep going. Like what we tell all the, uh, we love repeat applicants. Um, yeah. sometimes no it need just, to reinvent the wheel. It's just that no. there's only so many people that we can work with every year. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's often, it's not you, it's us. We promise. <laughs> <laughs> Um, great, great question. Catherine says, I also work at an arts nonprofit, but I don't have gallery representation for my work. Would this be considered institutional support? Um, no, Catherine, we're, when we talk about institutional support, we're basically saying, um, is a gallery um, selling your work on your behalf and, um, you know, helping you get exhibitions, helping you get exhibitions, creating a kind of financial stability for you. And in some ways that the gallery system can work kind of subsidizing your practice, right? Supporting you that way. Or we're talking about um, being enrolled in a, in a degree seeking program that's providing institutional support and structure for your practice. Um, so that would not count. You are totally eligible. We love nonprofit friends. Please apply. Um, all right, Anonymous asks, if a project submitted is part of a long-term project, would that be acceptable? Example, I have an artist book I will be finishing this year that I started in 2019. Most of it was done 2020 to now. Yes, what do you think? that is actually was in my notes to bring up earlier and I totally missed it with my whole technical snafu. So thank you for asking that. Um, if you have a project that's part of a longer or more sporadic kind of thing, I think it's totally fine to include works before 2020 if you're also including the more recent works. So, you know, starting uh, those work examples in, you know, January 2020 might not show really the full scope of what that body of work is. So in that case, you know, one or two images from earlier, I think would be okay. But just picking, you know, 
your favorite print from 2012 to just throw in there is maybe not so advisable. Um, but if it's just a project that has taken a long, long time, which totally happens, then it's totally fine to um, include some of those earlier images to give that full scope. Yeah, I think the the reason for the the kind of limit on the time is really that we want to see that you're like actively doing the work and um uh and and so we, I, I agree with Robin. I think that's close enough. <laughs> um so we've got a little bit of time left and so we'll um hang out for another minute. Um if folks have any more questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Um, and maybe, um, as we wait for any questions that might trickle in, um, I'll ask Robin a question. I love to ask Robin while we wait for questions, which is like, what's your favorite part about working on new voices? Um, I mean, I think I got into it a little bit earlier, but really it's just that, um, I get to, I feel like I really get to know and, um, work really closely with this group from year to year, getting to do it two years now has been super interesting to see, um, you know, it's just, it's a totally different group of people and how they interact with each other is totally different from year to year. Um, I also think that um, it's just really special throughout the whole process, not just the people who are accepted into the cohort. Um, this is probably also the answer I gave last year because it's still my favorite part um, that I just get to be exposed to so many people's practices that I otherwise probably just would not end up bumping into. Um, particularly as the program gets to sort of grow year to year and the word gets out a little bit more, that's more people that I get to learn about and I get to go follow on Instagram. So personally, that's very exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Just get All to right. see what's happening in the art world. Get to see what's happening in the art world. Yeah. It's um the, the, the three day gathering is like also just super fun. <laughs> yeah. It's super fun to bring everybody together that you've been like working with for a couple months and and see them all kind of like when you get a bunch of people in the same room, it's like, what's it going to be? <laughs> <laughs> it's really fun. Um, all right. Super. I don't see. Oh, I see one question. Oh, Lynn, this was organized and informative. Awesome. Thank you, Lynn. Appreciate it. We look forward to your application. Um, so I don't see any more questions coming in unless you see any more in the chat, Robin. Nope. All set. Awesome. All right. So with that, um, thank you guys for joining us. Um, by way of um, by way of closing, oh, I meant to keep that up, but sorry, guys. Um, by way of closing, uh, I'll just say um, thank you again for being here um, and for bringing these questions to us. I hope that this helped out. Um, and like we said, this is still a new program for us. Um, so, you know, we, we learned a lot in the first two cohorts. We learned, uh, we're learning as we go still about how we can invest our resources and really leverage them to support artists. So the questions you ask and the questions you ask Robin during the process are really, really helpful for us in thinking about how we develop the program to meet your needs. So thank you for that. Um, once again, please spread the word. We had about 500 applications the first two cycles. And we are really trying to improve representation of our um, in the applicant pool from states, especially in the South and the Southwest and kind of the upper plains. So please let your networks of printmakers and print adjacent folks know, especially folks who are working in those regions. Um, New Voices is on until August 24th. This fall, we're opening a show called Reprint that bridges the historical and the contemporary. And it's about how artists look at and work from printed source material. And it has a lot of very traditional printmaking in it. That is opening September 12th. We hope we see you there. If you're local, please come by and say hello. Um, always more info on our website, printcenternewyork.org, on our email newsletter, and on Instagram at Print Center New York. Um, when the webinar ends, your browser will open a short survey. Um, please thank you for sharing your feedback there. It helps us know our audience better. It helps us develop um, better, more informative info sessions for new voices. Um, and thank you, Robin, for your very thoughtful work caring for new voices and everyone here for your interest in the program. We are excited to see what 2025 brings. Have Absolutely. a great night, everybody. We'll see you soon. Thank you.